Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 97, which reads as follows. Asadho akatanyuta santi cedho jayonaro hatavakaso vantaso save uttama poliso which uh, on the face means one who is faithless asadho akatanyu one who is ungrateful sandi cedho a robber, someone who breaks into other people's houses. Jayonaro, whatever man or person. Hatawakaso has destroyed opportunity, has cut off, has opportunity cut off. Wantaso is hopeless. Satwe Uttamapuriso, such a person is the height of humanity. So, a rather odd verse coming from the Buddha, uh, but you have to understand the context, and then we'll we'll explain that uh, on face value it means one thing, but when you understand the context, and when you think about when when a person looks at the Pali words, it means something quite different. So the story is again about Sariputta. And it's in regards to 30 monks who had been dwelling in the forest, intently practicing meditation. And the Buddha saw that there was, somehow he saw that they needed something. They needed perhaps to um, move away from faith, one might think, based on the story. The Buddha anyway saw that they needed some push, and if they were given a push in the right direction, it might put them back on the right path and lead them to become enlightened. He saw potential in them. And so he used Sariputta as his uh, sort of his catalyst by asking Sariputta a question when, he, when they were in his presence. So these monks came to the Buddha, pay respect the Buddha decided what he was how he was going to teach them he turned to Sariputta and he says Sariputta do you have faith sad sadahasi do you are, are, do you believe basically do you believe that the faculty of faith when cultivated when made much of leads to the deathless and ends in the deathless and asked about all five of the faculties it's not just the faith faculty but there are five faculties there's sadda which is faith or confidence vidya which is effort uh, sati which is mindfulness samadhi concentration or focus and banya which is wisdom so he asked about these five faculties, but he asked, do you believe? And Sariputta gave a, a sort of a uh, nuanced reply. He didn't just say yes or no. He said, it's not out of faith. He said, uh, I don't get to that with, uh, out of faith in the Blessed One. As we're in regards to the faith faculty being uh, when cultivated leading to Nibbana and same with the effort faculty and the mindfulness faculty and the concentration faculty and the wisdom faculty. And he says, but, so basically he says, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't go to faith in that regard, faith in the Blessed One in that regard. That's a Pali way of saying, I don't have faith in the Blessed One in that regard, or it can be interpreted to mean that. And he said, but someone who has not seen the truth, who has not come to realize the truth for themselves, such a person would have faith in the Blessed One thus.
Te Tattva Parisang Sadhaya. They would have faith in someone else thus, or would, would get to this by faith in someone else. So I don't, I don't go to faith in the Blessed One. I don't get to that through faith, faith in the Blessed One. And if we, as as Buddhists we tend to understand what he meant, like um, it's not out of faith, because he says, for someone who has not seen, not understood for themselves, they need to have faith. So it's actually pretty clear, but the Pali somehow makes it ambiguous. And these thirty monks, again with the criticism, start talking amongst themselves and saying, even Sariputta, it's amazing, he hasn't given up his wrong views, he's still faithless. He has no faith in the Buddha, he, is, he, he, he still after all this time uh, doesn't have this faith in the Buddha. It's a valid criticism. I mean, it would be if they, if they hadn't misunderstood what he was saying, if he had actually meant that. Uh, he just had no, no faith in the Buddha whatsoever. But of course, the Buddha hears about what they're they're saying and says, "Monks, what are you talking about?" And when they tell him, he explains to them. He says, "But you know, Sariputta, when I asked him, he he answered me quite clearly, and what he meant was that it's not faith, it's not out of faith, it's through understanding, and because he has seen the truth through the practice of." Uh, Samatha meditation, vipassana meditation, uh, has realized the path and fruition. Sadhaya, parisang sadhaya nagachati doesn't doesn't require faith. No, it doesn't get there through faith in another. It gets there through his own knowledge. And then he said this verse. And so what's interesting about this verse is it confuses them even more. Right? He says. Someone who is faithless is the best, is the height, and the meaning is they don't, they don't have faith. They don't require faith to know the truth. Such a person who has seen the truth for themselves and no longer requires, no longer has to believe. Right. So you tell them the truth, and they can verify or, or deny it. They can verify the truth without requiring belief. You can say it's like this. They don't have to believe you. They know it is the truth. It's better, obviously. Akatanyu, and then he goes on to confuse them more, or or play with them more. He says, Akatanyu. Akatanyu literally means uh, one who... It literally means one of two things. But akata, a means not. Kata means done. And anyu, anya u means anyu means one who knows. So it usually means one who knows not what was done in the sense of knowing not what someone else has done for you. So if I do you a favor and you don't keep that in mind, you aren't, you aren't conscious of the fact that something's been done for you. It's a way of saying you're ungrateful. Akatanyu is a common word that means, it's a compound that means someone who is ungrateful for the things other people have done for them. It can also... And the Buddha is using it here in, in a different way. It means uh, one who knows that which is not done. Akata anyu. Akata means what is not done, or what is not made, the unmade. And the unmade here is nibbana. So it's a play on words that is, of course, lost in the in the English. But akata anyu means one who knows nibbana. Sandi cheda literally means one who cut, who has cut the chain. Sandi means the connection or the chain. And it, it is a word that it is a compound that was used to mean one who breaks into people's houses, cutting through the the, the locks, uh, the the lock on the door. But here is someone who has picked the lock on samsara and unlocked or broken the chain. It's more correct. No? Broken the chain of rebirth, so being born old, sick, and dying is a chain, and so one who has who has broken that is one who is free from samsara. Hatavaka, so one who has destroyed opportunity or has had opportunity cut off, means one who is who has no opportunities for them. That's what it normally would mean. 
But here it's a specific meaning. Again, it's a play on words, but it means for one, one for whom there is no opportunity for further becoming. So opportunity is in a sense a another word for becoming this or becoming that. You know, they don't they don't have ambitions or plans because they don't think about the future. And finally, one so means hopeless, and hopeless is of course a very good thing. It's an it's an it's an excellent thing to be hopeless. It means you have no hope. You don't hope for anything because you have no expectations, no expectations, no desires. You aren't living in the future again. You're living only in the present, perfectly flexible and, and content no matter what happens, no matter what comes or doesn't come. So this is the meaning the Buddha said, Satwe Uttama Puriso, such a one is indeed the height of humanity. So what does this mean for our practice? Well, first, um, before we actually get into the, the context, in the story the Buddha talks about the five faculties, which in and of themselves are a really good teaching. This is a teaching that has been taken from the Sanyutta Nikaya, and it's an important teaching. We have uh, the concept of these five faculties and talk about them uh, in the meditation practice. You have to balance confidence with wisdom and cultivate them both, but in tandem. So if you have too much confidence, not enough wisdom, that's a bad thing. If you have a lot of wisdom, but you don't have any confidence in it, so you know a lot of things, not really wisdom. And But without the confidence, you're always doubting the things that you learn and the things that you come to understand. Do I really? Did I really see that? Is this really useful? Effort and concentration also have to be balanced. So if you have a lot of effort, you'll become distracted without enough focus if the effort isn't focused enough. If you have a lot of focus but not the effort, you'll fall into a, a, a stupor and you'll become tired and fall asleep. So these two have to be balanced as well and they both have to be cultivated. Now sati, sati is the ability to see things as they are basically, to recognize uh, reality. Sati means to recognize or to remember, to remember yourself, I mean to remind yourself, the ability to see things and to recognize things as they are without any kind of extrapolation, not think, seeing things as good or bad or so on. So mindfulness is actually what balances the other faculties because you don't get off uh, in one way or another, you don't get caught up in too much energy, too much concentration, you become natural, you just let things sort themselves out without forcing anything. So absolutely these five, when, when they work together and when you use mindfulness to balance the other four, are definitely the path to the deathless. And by the deathless is meant this, you know, this freedom from the rounds of rebirth, freedom from being born again. The only way to not die is to not be born. And so if we're born again and again and again, we'll always have to die again and again and again. So deathless just means that state of freedom from that. That's the first lesson. Second lesson, of course, again, this lesson criticizing others can be uh, a dangerous thing to do if you're not clear. But on the other hand, these 30 monks were provided the perfect opportunity for the Buddha to teach the Dhamma. So... There is that. Something, when something's uncer unclear and when something appears to be wrong, it is important not to keep quiet and think, oh, well, I don't want to stir up the boat. It is important to bring it up and ask why. Why is it like that? You know, and why does it seem like this monk is faithless? And then when we get into the actual verse, we have some important things to say, I think. Asado is really an important point. It's a difference between Buddhism and other religions. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't believe anything. It just means that belief, believing in something is inferior to knowing it for yourself, and Buddhism will always hold it to be so. Whereas other religions believe that faith is ultimate. They believe there are certain things that you can't know, that it is somehow important to have faith in. And so they set up this system whereby you cultivate faith and you have to work hard to cultivate it because faith is not something that is stable, not like wisdom. 
or not like mindfulness, not like awareness. Faith is something, well, not like wisdom actually, because wisdom is stable when you come to see things clearly. You, you don't have to work to maintain it. No. It's something that is uh, stronger. Um, whereas with faith, you have to push and push, and you have to, you have to, uh, you have to always be repressing your doubts. Or you could say, faith that comes with wisdom, when they're both balanced, the faith that comes with wisdom. Because in fact, you could also say that Sariputta has perfect confidence in the truth. You know, he has perfect confidence in the things that the Buddha was asking him. He said, the answer is yes, and he has perfect confidence in that. But it's faith that's based on wisdom, based on knowledge. And so again, how you have to, uh, how you have to balance them. But the Buddha was fairly critical about the idea of people who just take things on faith, which it was a big thing in, in the Buddha's time as well. The Brahmins were big on faith. They believed that their rituals had some higher meaning to them without an, any rational explanation, or they believed in this god or that god without having seen or heard. They believed in Brahma. So they created all these beliefs, and then they just had faith in them. They didn't have any knowledge or understanding about their truth or falsehood. So in meditation, this is our. This should be our our emphasis, not on believing that somehow this meditation is going to help us, but in using the meditation to learn about ourselves, so that we don't need faith, we don't need to believe anyone else. That's really what we're doing. You want? I can tell you all about the mind, how the mind works, and how what reality is like. I can give you lecture after lecture, but that's always going to be uh, uh, inferior to you actually opening up the box and looking inside, which is what you do in meditation. You start, you open up and you look, and you see how, how are things going on. The, the, the technique that we give you is just to provide you with a framework, like a tool in which to look, like when you peer into a microscope. We give you this and you look in the microscope and whatever is there you'll see. So watching your stomach rising and falling as you watch it, and you use the, the mantra to keep yourself objective, you'll start to see things. You'll be in an objective frame of mind, like you're focusing the microscope. And once you get it well focused, you'll be able to see things as they are, and then you won't need to believe me. Akatanyu is about what this is all about. The height, the, the pinnacle, is to see that which is not made, or to know that which is not made. And point being, that as you look in this microscope through the meditation, what you're going to see is that everything that arises ceases. And you'll come to the, the, the realization or the understanding that there's nothing in the world that is a truly and intrinsically of value. There's no experience that you can have, no goal you can attain in the world, because everything is, is made by causes and conditions. It arises and it ceases, and it, it's a part of a web of causation. Now nibbana, or this, there is there is that which is outside of of this cause of causation. It doesn't arise, and therefore it doesn't cease. And this, so this is considered to be the the height. When someone realizes this, it's unique. They have this experience of some unique state, or unique entity, or unique reality that is unmade, that is unformed, unborn. So that is the height. It's something that changes the way we look at reality because in contrast, everything else becomes meaningless. And when one, one who has realized this or seen this, um, they'll, never be, they'll never be enticed by or intoxicated by those things that arise and cease because they're clearly, categorically inferior. Santi Cheda means cutting the link. So another great thing is one doesn't have to be born old, sick, and die again. I mean, people sometimes, most humans are fairly much attached to life, and if you ask them, would you like to come back and do this all again and again, many would, I think, say, yes, please, it would give me an opportunity to learn more and to experience things I didn't experience in this life. It would be great to come back. Forgetting as we do, um, this is uh, we have this confirmation bias or positive bias 
So we, we're very quick to forget about all the problems in life. And moreover, when, when you think it through, what you're talking about is an infinite uh, recursion, right? You're talking about this infinite, infinite cycle. And so it's that that is fairly problematic because it, it really becomes meaningless after a while and it ends up being not nearly as much trouble as it's worth. Being a human being is a lot of trouble. And clearly, we've in all the time we've spent in the rounds of rebirth, we keep coming back to things like this. We go up and down, and so sometimes it's great, and sometimes it's horrible. Sometimes it's mind-numbingly painful and, and cruel and, and unpleasant. Sometimes it's pleasant, incredibly, uh, stupefyingly pleasant. But in the end, it's just a round of rebirth again and again. And in the end, it's such a completely unsatisfying. It's not something that you intellectually or, or let go out of faith. You don't have to believe me. The point is that when you look closely, you naturally incline away from it. So through the meditation, you become less inclined to create, less inclined to chase after this pleasure because it's a lot of work. And then it, you have it and then it disappears and you've, you're left with nothing except your, your attachment to it, which then leads to, you to lots of suffering. So cutting the stream, this is the cutting the chain. This is the part of the goal, and it's just it, this again with the theme. It just goes back to knowledge, not belief. It's not something to be afraid of. You can't just fall into it. Most people, I think, are afraid of the idea of nibbana or some kind of uh, unknowable, mis uh, mysterious state of so-called freedom. But when you've experienced it, there's no question in the mind which is preferable. Mind lets go immediately of those things that are completely unbeneficial and unsatisfying. Hatawa kaso means they've given up the opportunity for becoming, and this has to do with giving up defilements. It means giving up all kinds of unwholesomeness, but also any kind of wholesomeness. So giving up the desire to even do good in the world, to bring the world to good, to save the world, to change the world. All of these things one eventually gives up, and that's considered preferable, because in the end you can't change the world, you can't fix the world. In the end, everything that you've done in the world will cease and fade away. And over time, in the face of eternity, it's really nothing. You want to save the planet, save the environment. To some extent, that's a good deed. It's kind of you to think about other people and to think about society and want everyone to be happy, so it's good. And for most of us, it's a great thing. But for someone who becomes enlightened, they give up any idea of fixing things. Because in the end, it's inherently broken. Of course, along the way, they do a lot of good. And by becoming enlightened, they also do a lot of good. And end up making the world a better place for everyone because they give up their own greed, their own attachments, their own conflicts and anger and their own arrogance and conceit and so on. So there's no there's there's really not nothing to criticize about it. But they certainly give up everything. They have no opportunity for for this future becoming no more ambition. And want does so they are hopeless. So our practice is to give up our hopes. Because if you hope, it means you still have a goal. And when someone becomes free from suffering, when they attain the ultimate goal, then there's no other reason for them to hope or wish. They say that hopes and wishes are actually a cause of suffering. Because even if you get what you want, get what you wish for, you'll, still, you'll at the same time be giving rise to attachment to it. And then you build up and build up the attachment until eventually that goal is attained and, and lost over, the, over time. At which, point all, at which point all you're left with is the attachment, which again leads to suffering. So this is an explanation of that verse and sort of a outline of the sorts of qualities of an enlightened being our own practice, we emulate some of these and we cultivate some of these and we keep some of them in mind philosophically to help us know how to direct our minds in the meditation practice. So, another useful, if a bit, I would say tongue-in-cheek. I mean, I don't really want to implicate any implicate the Buddha in any way, but it's, it's definitely a clever verse. 
uh, meant perhaps it seems to to shock and to throw off guard the listener so that's the verse for tonight thank you all for tuning in wishing you all the best be well <laughs>